Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. We begin our discussion tonight with an overview of the 16th meeting of the Secretaries of the Security Council of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, member states in Dushanbe. Last year's meeting was held virtually because of COVID-19 concerns. The National Security Advisors discuss issues like transboundary crime, countering extremism and terrorism, illegal trafficking in arms and narcotics, and other security-related aspects. In India, there was also speculation in the run-up about a possible meeting between Dr. Moeed Yusuf, Pakistan's NSA, and Ajit Doval, India's NSA. Dr. Yusuf had, however, made clear that there was no bilateral scheduled with his Indian counterpart. At the meeting earlier today, it was the first interface between Yusuf and Doval. At last year's virtual meeting, Doval had left after his objection to Pakistan's political map went unheeded. It is both interesting and somewhat ironic that in February, after the LOC ceasefire agreement, a number of media outlets ran stories with details, and I would say quote-unquote details, I'm going to put it in course, about the back channel and meetings between Yusuf and Dhol. Speculation is again rife that India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's meeting with the Gupkar Alliance tomorrow is a precursor to his restoration of statehood to occupied and illegally annexed Kashmir, and that plugs in with other developments, including a reach out to Pakistan. Once again, all of these are essentially speculations, and there are a number of viewpoints that you know people uh, put forward, uh, as happened yesterday also when I was talking to uh, on this program with some Kashmiri journalists. Anyway, to discuss these issues, I am joined by Swasni Heather national editor and diplomatic affairs editor at The Hindu, Ambassador Najmuddin Shah, former foreign secretary, and Ambassador Zameer Akram, a former diplomat with long experience of bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. Let me begin with Suhasni here. So Suhasni, uh, I remember you were on my program when this entire thing about discussion about back channel was going on. And I had asked you at that time uh, about stories in the Indian media uh, some of which uh, had rather, you know, uh, granular details about meetings that never happened. So, uh, and, and then, you know, in the run-up to this once again, and for instance, the Times of India said after it was said by uh, Moiz Yusuf that there was no bilateral scheduled, uh, Times of India said, oh, there's going to be perhaps a pull-aside uh, moment. Uh, so give me a sense of, you know, where do these stories come from? Uh, I don't know, uh, Ejaz, because uh, it's not just uh, the Indian media, <clears throat> as you pointed out. I think both the dawn and the news had some pretty granular details uh, about the kind of assurances that uh, Pakistani officials said that they had received uh, from Indian officials during these back-channel talks. Look, at the end of the day, um, since we last spoke, I think there are close to 12 or 15 articles um, in international as well as Indian and Pakistani media, uh, essentially making the point again and again that some kind of back-channel exists. Uh, now, the UAE envoy uh, to the U.S., has also, in an uh, interview with uh, Mr. McMaster, the former uh, NSA of the United States, uh, said very clearly that the UAE was part of some kind of mediatory process uh, to bring Indian and Pakistani officials together. Uh, so we are seeing, it's, it's uh, I mean, uh, you know, the idea that this is speculation is simply because we don't have official confirmation of it. Uh, but I think these stories are uh, fairly sound. Um, they're grounded uh, in, uh, in talks, in, in uh, briefings or discussions with officials in India, in Pakistan, and uh, uh, as the case may be in other countries as well. Uh, and uh, uh, most importantly, they have not once uh, been uh, denied outright. All that is, we've seen by way of denial is Mr. Yusuf's uh, comment that it was not him who was in conversation with uh, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval. Uh, but apart from that, we're, we haven't really seen any uh, um, uh, any real denials. And finally, I'll make the point that look at the facts on the ground. Uh, at the end of February, we did have a ceasefire between the two countries. 
that ceasefire was uh, was announced with a document or a, a statement, a three-part statement that I don't think was written in military language. It seemed to have uh, the imprimatur of not just diplomats, but because it was a joint statement, had to have had some kind of uh, higher-up coordination as well. Um, the, we've also seen that ceasefire hold. We've seen certainly a softening of rhetoric on both sides. Prime Minister Imran Khan has gone, uh, you know, from talking about a, a plebiscite in a referendum in the last few months. We've basically heard him uh, speak about reversing some of the steps taken on August 5th. Uh, in March, we actually heard him say, in May, we actually heard him say uh, he was willing to talk if India was to prefer a roadmap. Uh, on the way forward in Jammu and Kashmir. On the Indian side, it's very clear that the rhetoric is much lower. We went through an entire batch of elections, uh, and it's surprising that we have, to, uh, we have to point that out, but that entire batch of elections happened without any references uh, to Pakistan. Um, so I, I do think we're seeing some kind of a, a coordinated attempt at bringing down the tensions on both sides. Maybe the talks are informal. Maybe they haven't reached a very uh, important moment yet. Uh, but there is enough uh, really on the ground there to talk about them. Okay. Um, okay. So the dawn and the news that you were talking about, they were, uh, you know, uh, they came in the wake of uh, a briefing. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you recall, uh, when the entire thing started, uh, the Pakistani media was very quiet for almost a uh, week, 10 days, while stories were emerging in the Indian media. And of course, <laughs> interestingly, as you pointed out, uh, officially there was there were more statements from Pakistan there, than there have been from India. So the Indian media and the Pakistani officials have been more at it uh, than the Pakistani media and the Indian officials. But uh, one final question, where do you think uh, this is headed? Uh, there was also some speculation on my program yesterday, in fact, with reference to uh, Mr. Modi's meeting with the Gupkar Alliance. Uh, do you think there is some kind of, you know, uh, argument can be made with reference to the larger reach out to Pakistan and, and you know, normalizing things, or is that going to be a stretch? You know, I know that the official position in New Delhi will be no, they're completely disconnected, but we do know what the timing is. And we're living in, uh, in, a, in a very, very uh, uh, important and dynamic moment in the South Asian uh, uh, region. We're seeing the U.S. pull out and what is going to uh, come out of that. We're seeing the U.S. working quite hard to have some kind of a deal before they're able uh, to pull out their troops. Uh, there is a game, if you like, of regional dominoes. You know, every piece is fitting into or is affected by another. Um, so I, I wouldn't totally rule out that when the Indian government looks at its uh, regional situation, whether it is with China and the tensions at the line of actual control, whether it is with the impending uh, changes in Afghanistan, uh, that, uh, that actually, you know, uh, the kind of peace or the kind of relative peace we have seen at the line of control for the last three to four months would actually fit in with, uh, with that larger picture, uh, trying to, uh, at least at the moment, uh, ensure that you have less challenges, particularly as you go into what looks like a challenging future. Right. Thank you. So that was Swasini Heather speaking with us. Let me go straight to Ambassador Sheikh here. Ambassador Sheikh, uh, your first thoughts with reference, you also heard uh, Swasini say what she said. Um, so <laughs> the floor is yours, sir. It's uh, really by my, uh, uh, in my view, uh, we must not underestimate the importance of the agreement that is, and uh, I would endorse uh, Swasani's view uh, that this was not a military to military uh, document. It was a document that had obviously uh, been looked at by uh, uh, the political figures and uh, what emerged was something that reflected also, in my view, reflected also the views that had been expressed uh, by the chief of army staff with, with regard to connectivity and with regard to the role that Pakistan would have in promoting this connectivity between Central Asia and South Asia. Now, obviously, uh, any move towards, uh, 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 towards such connectivity would require a better relationship uh, between uh, Pakistan and India to allow that particular traffic to flow. Uh, I have an idea that that is uh, what our intent uh, 
or the, the declared intent was, uh, but that it required as a precondition, I think, uh, that uh, uh, things had to change in, in, in Kashmir. Now, what are the nature of the changes? I, I think that the uh, Gupkar uh, declaration and, the, and what has been stated by the people who are now going to meet uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi tomorrow uh, seems to suggest, and I think uh, uh, Mrs. M uh, Mufti uh, put it very clearly that uh, uh, you have to have talks, but you have to, uh, in those talks, you have to talk to Pakistan also. And uh, how would Pakistan talk unless there was a, a re reversal or a movement towards reversal of the 5th August uh, uh, 2019 uh, step taken by by Prime Minister Modi? Now, does does uh, the restoration of uh, uh, the uh, territorial status of uh, uh, IOJK reflect that, or uh, does it not? This is a question that uh, well, I think I that's think a that's a very important question. Um, and let me take that to uh, Ambassador Akram. Uh, Ambassador Akram, uh, we uh, discussed this uh, on this program. Uh, the statements by the army chief and uh, which uh, to which uh, ambassador uh, sheikh was also referring and and we had said that it seemed uh, that we were coming across as as more eager than we should and and i think thankfully we did uh, put the brakes on it uh, and sort of you know uh, reaffirmed our our original position with reference to how India and Pakistan can actually talk. So give me your sense of how you look at these developments now. Uh, my view is uh, that to begin with, this whole idea of a back channel is not a good idea because it leads to the kind of speculation that we have seen uh, without really any uh, com commitments from, uh, particularly from the Indian side. And I agree with you that uh, we seem we seem to have come out to look as if we were more eager than our uh, Indian neighbors uh, about having a dialogue of this kind. Um, the other thing is that we need to be rooted in the, the, the realistic situation on the ground. Uh, there is no change on the ground uh, in Indian occupied Kashmir. And for me, this whole idea of having this back channel uh, from the Indian side serves their purpose to try and project to the international community, especially to the Biden administration, that uh, you know we are in a dialogue with Pakistan and that we are trying to address these issues. This is an old tactic in my experience that of dealing with India, I've seen that numerous times uh, of trying to shift the focus away from the real issues uh, towards this a dialogue that really never is a circular uh, dialogue, even if it takes place, uh, it's really a very circular dialogue without any uh, substantive effort to resolve the issue on the ground. The second thing is that the Indians have been under pressure because of the confrontation they've had with China uh, on the Galwan Heights. And so they are in really in a two front situation along the line of actual control with China and the line of control with Pakistan. And so they, it is in their interest to lower the temperatures on the line of control. And, uh, you know, and for that reason, uh, this kind of dialogue between the Director General's military operations. Now that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing because if it helps to protect the people living on the line of control is fine. But I think we should not read too much. That's the point that I want to make, that we should okay, not have read I, I, so uh, much into this. Absolutely. But the, the more interesting point uh, that you have raised, Ambassador Akram, is a point that I want to take back to Ambassador Sheikh, and that is uh, with reference to uh, back channel and how the back channel uh, is, is, uh, you know, is a framework that redounds more to India's advantage than to Pakistan's. Ambassador Sheikh, would you agree with that assessment? Uh, you you could say that if we talked about the fact that we were uh, our, our we saw our future as lying in connectivity and in uh, looking at our location in geoeconomic terms rather than in geopolitical. 
obviously obviously this uh, makes it important for us uh, to have some sort of uh, uh, dialogue uh, with uh, India, uh, even while maintaining our position on on Kashmir, and when we uh, do that, uh, then obviously uh, this particular uh, situation does arise where uh, uh, you say that uh, uh, on Kashmir we are firm uh, and we want a total reversal of uh, uh, 5th August uh, uh, 2019. Uh, but in practice, uh, what 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 will follow uh, if if uh, we do this? I, I think uh, uh, one can one can say that look, we have uh, commitments from the India, uh, and most particularly if uh, uh, nowhere else in the similar agreement, uh, that the two sides will sit together and uh, find a, a final uh, a solution. Uh, to uh, the uh, no, but should, should, uh, but I I think Prakram is uh, referring more to the framework, uh, the back channel, which is obviously giving rise to a lot of speculation, which is something uh, you know the Indian media has also been capitalizing on, um, which has to do with how you capture the narrative and present your own narrative. So I think he's talking more about that uh, than the idea of a dialogue in and of itself. You, you see, the, the, this thing about uh, the narrative and uh, who, who are you aiming your narrative at? Uh, uh, look, frankly, if you're talking about uh, an narrative aimed at your own population, that's one matter. But if you're doing it uh, internationally, one must recognize that at this particular time, uh, the uh, narrative uh, or the projecting of a narrative is uh, uh, India is much more advantageously placed. I'm not suggesting that it's a, uh, that is how it should be, but that is how you must recognize the realistic position. So, is so, so, so therefore, so therefore, so therefore, Ambassador Akram does have a point with reference to how uh, back channel is likely to work more to India's advantage than to Pakistan's because obviously nothing is really on the surface. Uh, but let me uh, take a theoretical situation to Ambassador Akram here. Ambassador Akram, so tomorrow the Gupkar politicians are meeting with uh, Narendra Modi. Now, assuming that Mr. Modi says that, yes, I am amenable to uh, restoring the statehood of occupied uh, Kashmir, which uh, my earlier action, by my earlier action, I had illegally annexed. Is that uh, something that we can live with or, uh, or make a basis for further dialogue? Okay, just the first thing I want to say is that for us, the most important thing should be the impact of this kind of narrative on the people of Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, and that's also the most important aspect from the Indian point of view. They want to project the point, point, uh, the narrative to them that you are essentially uh, going to be left high and dry by Pakistan. So you might as well come and join us. Uh, so that's the kind of narrative that does not suit us. We should not betray, we should not be seen to be betraying the Indians, uh, the, betraying the people of Indian occupied Kashmir. That's why for me, it's very important of what kind of position we take in this time. The second thing that the question that you have asked, uh, for me, the real uh, problem uh, with what India did last year uh, in 2019 is not so much 370, but Article 35A, which is meant to change the demographic nature uh, of uh, Indian occupied Kashmir and reduce the Muslim majority Kashmiris into a minority. And that's something that will have to be reversed. That is the more important thing. In terms of Article 370, yes, they have taken away the autonomy. But how much autonomy, autonomy did they really have in Kashmir despite 370? So that's not so much important for my, from my point of view. What is important is, okay. will the Indian government give up 
the demogra- the change in the demography of occupied Kashmir. Right. Uh, that's a very important point. Now, uh, I'm also joined by Dr. Rifat Hussain, who's head department of public policy at the National University of Science and Technology. Dr. Hussain, thank you so much. Um, I also uh, have Ambassador uh, Sheikh and Ambassador Zamir Akram, who you just heard uh, talk about it. So, uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, the uh, should we accept the bat channel framework? Uh, Ambassador Akram thinks that it uh, suits India more than it does Pakistan. Ambassador Sheikh thinks that if we are going to talk about geoeconomics uh, and and prefer that uh, to geopolitics, then we've got to have some kind of dialogue with India. Now, uh, Narendra Modi is going to meet the Gopkar Alliance tomorrow. And there are lots of speculations about perhaps he would, you know, uh, restore the statehood of uh, occupied Kashmir and all of that. Uh, so give me your sense of where things are headed and what do you think of, uh, of a back channel framework? Well, uh, thank you so much, Ijaz. Uh, I've just heard the last part of uh, Mr. Zamir Akram's uh, uh, point of view. Uh, and uh, I totally agree with him. But the, but the question is, that how do you persuade India to give up Article 35A or reverse uh, the situation and uh, get back to the status quo ante? Now, the Indian government's effort has been uh, that without talking to Pakistan, without acknowledging the relevance or the centrality of the back channel to the possibility of initiating India-Pakistan dialogue, they would like to treat it as an internal matter. And the June 24th meeting, uh, which is being chaired by uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, has to be seen in that context. It's an attempt to divide the, in, uh, the, uh, the Indian occupied Kashmiri leaders and I'm not sure whether all the Hurriyat leaders have been invited to this this particular uh, no, this meeting. No, this is the Gupkar. This is the, the this is the Gup Alliance politicians. This is not the 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 Hurriyat leaders. Uh, but the but the but even within Gupkar, only uh, I'm aware of the fact that Mufti uh, uh, Mahbuba. Mufti, Sajad Ali Lone, and, and uh, the National Conference people who are part of the Gopkar uh, Alliance, they have been invited. So, and we know that, you know, what are going to be their demands? So there's no unified stance, even amongst the, uh, the, uh, the participant of the Gopkar Declaration. So, uh, so, so, so in that sense, India's strategy is quite quite visible. It's quite remarkable from the Indian point of view that they would like to divide further divide of the uh, the uh, Kashmiri leadership and engage in the facade of a dialogue. And uh, there are people who are arguing that you know even if India were to hold this dialogue, there is no visible outcome that will uh, that will be produced. So my uh, uh, concern is that by doing these kind of what I call diplomatic antics, India wants to consolidate and you know and continue browbeating the Kashmiri leadership into submission. So uh, I don't see any hope at the light of the tunnel as far as the. Uh, this particular meeting that you are referring to is concerned. Okay. Now, uh, of course. Okay, uh, that's a, that's a very interesting point. I'm also running short of time, so I just want to quick, uh, you know, uh, quicken the pace of this, uh, uh, Ambassador Sheikh. Uh, so far from uh, this being something that kind of plugs in or might plug in into the larger scheme of things, i.e., the reach out to Pakistan, uh, Dr. Hussain thinks that this is another. Uh, ploy by the BJP government to actually internally divide the Kashmiris. Uh, would you want to comment on that? That we should look at is what is what are the views that Sajjad Loon, Shabir Shah, uh, Mirwais have uh, expressed on, on this particular issue, and where do you where does this 
very important segment of uh, Kashmiri leadership uh, make its views known. Uh, this is something because ultimately it is the uh, Kashmiri people and uh, the Kashmiri people and their leadership who are going to decide how they look at this, whether this uh, particular uh, uh, gambit. It's, uh, okay, so you you basically gambit. saying that we to keep an eye on what uh, they say with reference to this reach out. In any case, uh, in the next 24 to 36 hours, uh, we will get a sense of how this thing pans out. Um, but back to Ambassador Akram for his quick comments before I wrap up. Just I think that this Gupkar, uh, Gupkar uh, dialogue is basically with people uh, what Mr. Jinnah had originally called Indian Quislings. So talking to these Quislings is not going to solve Modi's problems in occupied Kashmir. The resistance, the opposition by the APHC, by the Kashmiri uh, majority of the Kashmiri Muslims uh, will continue. So whatever the outcome uh, of this dialogue is going to be immaterial in terms of the ground situation on the ground in occupied Kashmir is in my view. Uh, okay. Even these people, uh, the people with whom Mr. Modi is going to talk, will have problems because of Article 35A, because they, as being Kashmiris, don't want to lose the, the, the privileges right. that they have as a Kashmiri right. In, so, in so, so, let me, so let me ask a specific question uh, to Dr. Hussain on this. Uh, Dr. Hussain, once again, uh, we're obviously jumping ahead of the curve here. But in the event that Mr. Modi says that he is going to restore the statehood, in the event that he talks about the fact that 35A uh, will remain applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, the occupied Kashmir, that is, uh, does that become, or is that enough basis for Pakistan uh, to say, OK, uh, now we can talk to you? There are other conditions that have to be met in addition to the reversal of Article 35A, the release of the Kashmiri Hurriyat uh, leaders from jail, the uh, reversal of the draconian laws that have been put in place ever since August 2019, uh, and so on and so forth. So, okay. but the uh, so so my my sense is that this may be a necessary condition, but, but it's it, not a sufficient. Uh, there are other conditions. That it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ambassador Najmuddin Sheikh, Ambassador Zamir Akram, Dr. Rifat Hussain for their insights. We shall take a short break and return to discuss the situation in Afghanistan. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Violence continues unabated in Afghanistan. Intra-Afghan talks remain stalled. The morale of Afghan national security forces is going low as Taliban fighters gain territory, not just in their traditional southern and southeastern strongholds, but up in the north, in Tajik and Uzbek territories like Kunduz, Faryab, and Balkh. In Kunduz, Taliban have captured all entry points to Tajikistan south of the Panj River, including the Shir Khan dry port. In Balkh, they reached Madar -e Sharif before withdrawing. Meanwhile, sources say the U.S. might slow pace its withdrawal given the Taliban offensives. The U.S. is also looking for bases post withdrawal for counterterrorism operations. It seems far-fetched that what the U.S. could not do when on the ground, it would be able to do remotely. Afghanistan's President Rashid Ghani and High Peace Council Chairman Abdullah Abdullah are scheduled to meet U.S. President Joe Biden on Friday. Observers say Biden is likely to assure Ghani of continued funding for the Afghan government and security forces. To discuss the situation further, I'm joined by Musharraf, the founder and senior fellow Tabad Lab and Islamabad-based think tank, Mariam Wardak, an Afghan analyst and activist, and Dr. Carl, Carl, Carlton Teller, professor of political science at the University of Akron. Thank you to all my panelists. Let me begin with Mariam Wardak here. Mariam, I talked about the, the low morale of the Afghan national security forces. Uh, for instance, uh, just about a week ago, 
there was this incident in which at least 21 members of the Afghan special forces were killed uh, fighting the Taliban. Uh, this was in Dalatabad, Faryab. And the reason that happened was that they got surrounded and they did not get any reinforcement. As one of the officers said, the army did not come, police did not come, NDS did not come. Uh, so give me a sense. And there's also now official statements saying, well, you know, we don't want the, uh, the uh, security forces to be stretched. And therefore, we are tactically uh, withdrawing from certain areas. Give me your sense of how you look at the ground situation and uh, do you really think that the Afghan National Security Forces without close air support will be able to hold off Taliban advances? I would like to give your viewers a little bit more perspective of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. They're not actual numbers of how many forces that we have. The numbers that have been thrown around are uh, 300,000, which, which includes police, army and the intelligence officers. Recently, not only have the attacks increased, but there has been a huge change in leadership within the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. You have the Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior, and the Chief of Army Staff that will have been changed. Yes. That is going to have a dramatic impact on the morale of the Afghan National Defense Security Forces, especially after how hands-on the Chief of Army Staff Yassin Zia was. Um, there is very, there's a disconnect between the soldiers and the leadership. There is a low in morale in the sense that they, these office, these soldiers have been fighting for the past 20 years only to come make peace with individuals by force, not by the decision of the Afghan people, but by the decisions that the United States has made. There is so much confusion happening on the ground amongst the citizens themselves. And we have to take into perspective that all of this is correlated. The citizens are relatives of the Afghan uh, National Defense Security Forces, Afghan Taliban who are coming out looking like winners in this incident are also related to the Afghan National Defense Security Forces. There have been um, stories about one family who serves in the, uh, six members of the family, and one member serves in the Afghan National Army, the second one serves in the police, the third one serves in the intelligence, and the fourth one is an Afghan Taliban member. There is we have to think about how small the Afghan uh, uh, population is. It's a, a population of about 34 to 35 million. There's a disconnect between the government and the people. There's a disconnect between the Afghan National Defense Security Forces and the leadership. And now the strides that the Afghan Taliban are making uh, is quite concerning. And then at the fact that what do they want at the end, it seems that the narratives are not now, have been consistent, but reality is starting to creep up amongst the people. Why am I saying the Afghan Taliban member, Afghan Taliban narrative is consistent? Because they've never said how they're going to govern. They've never clarified the the way, the methodology, and they've always been consistent in the sense that they've wanted the Emirates. Right. They, um, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, bring in Dr. Colton Teller here. Uh, Dr. Colton Teller. Uh, what do you think is now going to be the U.S. strategy? This this entire talk about trying to find bases or using, uh, you know, uh, uh, counterterrorism uh, capabilities uh, that are uh, remote, that are not based inside Afghanistan. You really think that's going to be a viable strategy uh, when ground presence itself could not help the U.S. win the war? I think the United States is scrambling right now. To a great degree, the American national security apparatus was kind of caught flat-footed with Biden's decision to pull uh, U.S. forces out of Afghanistan by September of 2021. Uh, there had been almost unanimity that the U.S. needed to come up with a way to get out of the war that wouldn't threaten U.S. security interests. And that has really been a huge problem because I, I know I worked on this issue uh, with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Six years back, we were discussing how does the United States get out of Afghanistan and kill, still keep American security interests, uh, you know, solid and, and front and center, not, not domestic politics. And the issue always came down to two things, reconciliation between the warring 
parties in Afghanistan and having what are known as over the horizon capabilities so that the United States could strike at Al Qaeda or strike at the Taliban if need be. And neither of those things have worked out. We've not gotten reconciliation in any meaningful way in Afghanistan, and we have not settled the over the horizon issue. So there, there are no good options really now for the United States to be able to really aid the Afghan army if the Afghan army is completely collapsing, which looks to be what's the trajectory, or to strike at Al Qaeda or al other allied uh, terrorist forces in Afghanistan. So. The short answer to your question is the United States does not have good options to really uh, stabilize the situation in Afghanistan. Right. So uh, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, U.S. national security, uh, any possible threat from the, uh, the Afghanistan soil uh, is something which is, uh, you know, remote. Uh, we already have assessments by the new administration, as also the previous administration, with reference to new threats from China, Russia, and, you know, whether it's the climate change issue, whether it's the pandemics and all that. But really, uh, the, the way the situation is unfolding, uh, it's a real threat for Afghan civilians and also certain regional countries, including Pakistan. Absolutely. It's, it's a threat to the United States, pot potentially. I mean, one of the things you have to understand about the U.S. government is the U.S. government frequently decides, okay, this problem is solved, we're now going to turn to this problem. That doesn't really mean the first problem is actually completely solved. So you see in the U.S. security establishment now a huge swing towards great power competition, focus on China, focus on Russia, to a lesser degree focus on, on Iran. Uh, and North Korea. The, the counterterrorism mission of the United States security establishment has been pushed way down the line of priorities. That doesn't mean that everything has gotten better and it's absolutely uh, uh, gone away as a threat. It's just the way the U.S. government works. They, they can only handle so many issues at a time and they focus and they pivot. Uh, yeah, the, the long-term consequences of Afghanistan once again falling under Taliban rule, uh, there aren't very many people I know in the U.S. security establishment that say that's going to be a good thing for the region, certainly not going to be a good thing for the Afghan people, and could potentially come to haunt the United States as al-Qaeda and potentially ISIS builds capabilities in Afghanistan. Uh, so, yeah, this, I, I wouldn't take this to mean that the United States has assessed that there's no al-Qaeda threat or that we don't have to worry about ISIS anymore. This is simply the, the way the U.S. government works with these pivots. Okay. Uh, Musharraf Zadi, you have written an article, uh, absolutely, definitely, maybe not. Uh, it's basically uh, <laughs> what... Uh, the Prime Minister said to uh, Jonathan Swan uh, in an interview. Now, your argument is that uh, even if we don't do anything, what the Prime Minister is saying, we don't want to get involved uh, in another war, your argument is that that's not, a, that's not going to help because it will come to you. And, and therefore, uh, is perhaps better if we have the kind of cooperation that we've been extending to the Americans, um, and, and which is where you you playing on this whole idea of what the Prime Minister said, absolutely not. So explain to me how this is going to work, uh, and why can one not argue that if we do become part of, or facilitate the, the American efforts, that in that case, we actually inviting trouble. I guess the best way to situate the argument would be to refer to what I think Mariam uh, Wardak just said, uh, which I think really should be the starting point uh, uh, for, for any discussion about Afghanistan, which is actually the safety and well-being of the people of Afghanistan. I think what's been happening for a couple of decades now, and obviously this is a grotesque simplification, but time is, is, uh, is, is of the essence here. Uh, so, so this is a time-bound, uh, uh, you know, medium, and and the short version is that for 20 years we've said American lives are really important. After 9/11, it became imperative that the 
global war machine led by the Americans would land into Afghanistan and fix the problem that was caused in New York and in Washington, D.C., and on a field somewhere in Pennsylvania, uh, that that problem could be fixed by going to the source. And now what we're saying is, uh, we don't know if that problem can be solved or not. Let's try and see if the Afghans, between themselves, uh, the Republic and the Emirate, between the two can, can sort it out. And if we can't, we'll let the Pakistanis handle it. Now, in, in this entire scenario, the principal uh, losers and, and, the, and, the, and the victims are the people of Afghanistan, especially the poor and the vulnerable, uh, most of whom will be women and children. And uh, in a sense, the perpetrators, uh, in many cases, are also Afghan, but in some cases will be a drone strike or some sort of other intelligence-based operation that targets a given number of people uh, or groups in Afghanistan. Right, I, I get your point. But here's the thing. One, uh, if you read the Prime Minister's op-ed uh, in, in Washington Post, which I'm sure you have, uh, he's basically saying that uh, we want to have good relations with whoever is ruling in Kabul, whoever controls Afghanistan. Uh, so it's not specific to the Taliban, at least uh, uh, not as far as his uh, uh, you know, op-ed is concerned. And secondly, we have fenced. Um, and uh, after that, and, and we are also still trying uh, our, our damnedest to somehow get the intra-Afghan dialogue uh, to, to uh, start. Uh, but there are certain forces and exogenous factors that, that are not in Pakistan's control. So, so I, I think uh, the Prime Minister seems to have a point I mean, I'm not sure I, I agree with his take on operations in erstwhile FATA, uh, and I, I remember having criticized his, his positions on that. But I think he does have a point when he says that we should try and, you know, sort of uh, keep ourselves as sort of enclosed from the fallout as we possibly can. I have no doubt that Pakistan is not supporting the Taliban for a Taliban takeover. I also don't think the Taliban takeover is as easy as a lot of people seem to think. Uh, just today, uh, we've seen Atta Muhammad Noor kind of mobilize his uh, militia, uh, and, and I think there'll be a lot of knock-on effects from that, uh, from that single activity. So, the, you know, Kabul is not going to be a cakewalk, and 1996 is not about to repeat itself. We're in 2021. I think the thing that Pakistanis in particular should be focusing on is that it isn't good enough to say we don't support one or the other party and we'll support whoever's in charge in Afghanistan. I think the Americans, the Turks, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, the, the Qataris, uh, along with the Pakistanis, need to ensure that the clarity as to who is in charge in Afghanistan is achieved sooner rather than later with zero or minimal bloodshed. Because without that, all the other conditions won't be met. So Pakistan's ability I, to stay out of it between the between the Taliban and the Americans is contingent on a stable regime in Afghanistan, but, and but that Musharraf, is contingent but, on the sense of security that Afghans have. But Musharraf, that's that's the the, the entire problem. I mean, uh, Pakistan just does not have the means. It doesn't have the toolkit to ensure that as quickly as possible, uh, you know, there is clarity on who actually controls Afghanistan. But let me bring in Mariam Wardak here uh, with reference to what you have said. Uh, Mariam, is there anything you want to uh, say with reference to what Musharraf was saying or add to it? Uh, Musharraf has also said, uh, talked about uh, Atta Muhammad mobilizing his militia. Uh, frankly, he would have done that. But if you look at it from another perspective, you have Jamiat e Islami uh, splintered along, you know, Ismail Khan, uh, Atta uh, Noor on, on one side, uh, you know, uh, Salauddin Rabbani leading it from a, from a political perspective, Ahmad Shah Massoud's son, uh, you know, sort of putting together his own militia. So it seems that that's the kind of disunity. Uh, that uh, created the Taliban in the first place in the 90s, and that actually got the Taliban uh, to get to where they did. Just taking a step back here, I think that we should be aware that these pr private militias are financed. And that is why these private militias will be able to fight against the Afghan Taliban. The minute the finances run out, 
they will not fight the Afghan Taliban anymore. The, con the concern here is whether the Western or other neighboring countries will provide finances to these uh, these leaders to continue their private militia for chaos in Afghanistan to persevere. Now, whether it's Dostum, whether it's Ahmad Ziyad Masood, whether it's Atta, they have not been in power in so long, and their finances are coming to an end. Many of them, many have them been de-armed um, in the past, I think, three years with uh, Vice President Amrullah Saleh. However, there have been rumors on the ground that Amrullah Saleh is also financing, uh, providing ammunition to people in the north in case there is violence that continues from Afghan Taliban. I, I think that these individuals are very minute examples uh, in how they can challenge the Afghan Taliban. When it comes to the ground reality, it's pretty much what the Afghan people want. In many of the provinces that are outside of Kabul, um, they will accept the Afghan Taliban's way of operation and uh, governance style. It's just Kabul that is very resistant to the Afghan Taliban, and that has a lot to do with the corruption cycle. It has a lot to do with the lack of uh, mo Taliban modernization. And it also has to do with the fact that the youth have progressed. Majority of the population of Afghanistan is below the age of 35, which is 75 percent. And these individuals have now been educated. Now, these educated individuals are going to need some sort of mean of uh, negotiation, what they will give up and what the Afghan Taliban will come up. But at the time, we are still at stalls when the negotiation in Qatar and violence is seems to be the only methodology that the Taliban will take forward. And the fear that is spreading amongst the people has a lot to do with the fact that Australia has left, the fact that America continues to market that we are leaving Afghanistan which gives the Afghan people this reason to just give up and adhere to whatever the Afghan Taliban want. Is this right? Is this wrong? How are, how are we moving this forward? There's no answer for it. We know that the last 20 years has been a failure with communication, with negotiation, and with the style of governance. The, I know that the Afghan government has been selected by the Afghan people, but that Afghan popu population is very minute. And it shows you that there is a disheartening with the Afghan government. The, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what Ashraf Ghani and Dr. Abdullah Abdullah will come to uh, will come to some sort of agreement with President Biden. But this does bring pressure on President Biden on how what the outcome of the Afghan people will will be because it will fall on his shoulders. The same thing that President Obama did when he announced the soldiers to leave. I think it was January 20-something that he was going to withdraw 40,000 troops, giving the uh, enemies of Afghanistan clear announcement that don't do anything to our troops, just wait until we leave. President Biden has extreme, followed his footsteps. I think that discretion is very necessary, communication with the people is necessary, and more important, you have to make sure that the Afghan National Defense Security Forces are stabilized and financed. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam Bardet. Thank you. Uh, Musharraf Zaidi, thank you, Dr. Carl Colton Teller. This is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.